Very well. Good morning, Council.
Very well, Mr. Gutros, are we ready with the next witness? Hi, Your Honor, Mr. McGill will be examining. Very well, Mr. McGill, call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Matthew McGill, Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher for the plaintiffs. The plaintiffs call Dr. Michael Lamb. My name is Michael Lamb, spelled L-A-M-B. Good morning, Dr. Lamb. Good morning, Mr. McGill. Dr. Lamb, what is your current occupation? I'm currently a professor and head of the Department of Social and Developmental Psychology at the University of Cambridge in England. And before you held your uh, position at the University of Cambridge, uh, what position do you hold before that? Uh, for 17 years before that, I was head of the Section on Social and Emotional Development at the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development in Washington. And what did your duties as section head of the National Institutes of Health entail? Uh, my responsibilities were to uh, conduct research and to direct a team of researchers studying issues that had to do with children's social and emotional development. How long have you studied developmental psychology, Dr. Lamb? Uh, I began studying developmental psychology in 1970s, early 1970s, so nearly 40 years. And what are your primary areas of study within the field? Um, there have been two broad areas of research in which I focused. Uh, the first, unrelated to the topic of, of this litigation, has to do with the uh, investigation of sex crimes involving children and particularly in the development of appropriate means of interviewing young children who are allegedly victims. The second line of research has to do with the factors that affect children's development and adjustment. What do you mean by the term adjustment? Um, I use the term adjustment as a fairly broad term to refer to those aspects of children's development um, uh, that allow them to function effectively in their uh, current environment. So, for example, um, a well-adjusted child would be one who had no significant behavioral or psychological problems, who was able to uh, interact effectively and smoothly, not only with adults, but also with other children. Um, uh, somebody who was able to perform well and, and um, uh, achieve appropriately at school. Uh, if one is thinking about older children, often um, one sign of maladjustment would be um, involvement in antisocial or, or delinquent behavior. Um, uh, and then as one goes into adulthood, um, uh, adjustment would refer to the ability to form successful intimate relationships with other individuals, um, as well as perform effectively as a member of society. Is there a body of literature that focuses specifically on the adjustment of children parented by gay men and lesbians? Yes, there is. Can you describe in general terms the, uh, the breadth and depth of that literature? Well, it's a uh, fairly substantial body of literature by this point. It, this is a question that has been um, being researched since the late 1970s and early 1980s um, uh, and over the succeeding decades there's accumulated a large number, maybe over 100 separate peer-reviewed professional articles, um, many other um, reports in, in other fora, um, so that the, we now have, a, I think, a very good understanding of the factors that affect the adjustment of children being raised by gay and lesbian children. Would you say Sorry, that... Parents. <laughs> would you say that you're familiar with that body of research, Dr. Lamb? Yes, I think I am. Have you provided, did you provide peer review for any of the reports included within that body of literature? Uh, yes, I have. And what is the purpose of peer review? Um, the purpose of peer review is a procedure that, that professional journals and publications use to ensure that the articles they publish 
um, uh, report studies that have been appropriately conducted, um, uh, that the results obtained have been both appropriately uh, analyzed and that they are uh, not only reported accurately and uh, appropriately, but also that they are integrated um, correctly into the wider body of literature on that topic. Dr. Lammer, are you familiar with the various methodologies used in the field of developmental psychology? I am, yes. Have you taught students on, on the subject of research methodologies? Yes, I do. Have you and I have. <laughs> Have you supervised other researchers in their own research efforts in developmental psychology? Yes, I have. Dr. Lamb, have you authored or en edited any books in the field of developmental psychology? Um, I have, yes. I've authored or edited about 40 books. And in addition to the books have you written, have you published any other writings relating to child development and adjustment? I have, yes. Approximately how many? I must have published in total maybe 500 articles. Not all of them would be about adjustment, of course. Some of them would be about interviewing. And where, for the most part, were those 500 articles published? Um, uh, they've been published for the most part in um, professional peer-reviewed journals um, or in chapters written for other professionals in professional books. Do you serve on the editorial board of any academic journals? Um, I do serve on several um, editorial boards, and I have served on others in the past as well, yes. Can you name a couple of the journals on which you've served on their editorial boards? Um, I've served in um, the editorial board of uh, Child Development and Developmental Psychology, um, although I'm not currently a member of either of those boards. Um, I'm currently on the, the editorial board of Child Abuse and Neglect, um, Developmental Review, infant behavior and development, and some others as well. How often would you say that you provide peer review uh, for an academic article? Um, uh, I would estimate that I review approximately two articles a week, so maybe 100 articles a year. And over the course of your career, about how many would that add up to? Well, um, uh, at the beginning of my career, happily, I wasn't having to do as many as that, but um, I would say probably a good 2,500 to 3,000 reviews in total. Dr. Lamb, have you received uh, any honors recently from professional associations? Uh, yes, I have. I received a, an award for lifetime contributions to psychology from the Association for Psychological Science in 2003. Um, Dr. Lamb, in, in front of you, you have... Uh, three books and then a binder. Um, using the, the tabs at, at the bottom of the binder, please turn to tab A. And that document behind the tab there is Exhibit TX2327. And Dr. Lamb, is Exhibit TX2327 a copy of your curriculum vitae? It is, yes. And does that document list your educational degrees and publications? It does, yes. Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to offer Exhibit PX2327 into evidence. No objection, Your Honor. Very well. 2327 is admitted. And then, Your Honor, we would like to tender Professor Michael Lamb as an expert in the field of developmental psychology of children, including the developmental psychology of children raised by gay and lesbian parents. No objection, Your Honor. Very well. Proceed then, Mr. McGill. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Lamb, are you going to offer any opinions in this case? I am, yes. What are they? I'm going to offer two broad opinions. The first is that um, uh, we have a substantial body of evidence documenting that children raised by gay and lesbian parents are just as likely to be well-adjusted as children raised by heterosexual parents. And I'm going to offer the opinion that um, uh, for a significant number of these children, their adjustment would be uh, promoted were their parents able to get married. Dr. Lamb, is there a consensus within your field as to the factors that most affect child adjustment? There is, yes. At this time, I'd like to publish my first demonstrative. Well, while that's 
getting up on the screen, Dr. Lamb. Why don't you tell us what, the, uh, th what those factors are? Well, as I said, there is um, a, a substantial consensus has developed over the last 30 or 40 years of research um, uh, documenting that um, the factors that affect children's development fall broadly into um, these three broad categories of factors that are summarized on, on your overhead. Um, uh, the first of those is the quality of the relationships that children have with their parents or the people looking after them. Um, uh, there's a large body of evidence showing that children are better adjusted when they have good, warm, uh, close relationships with parents who are committed to caring for them uh, and looking after them. Um, uh, and that children's development is conversely um, uh, hindered when they don't benefit from such relationships with people offering such uh, parental behavior. The second set of factors um, have to do with the relationships between the individuals um, who are raising the child. Uh, and again, here we have a large number of studies showing that children's development is adversely affected when there is conflict between those individuals. Um, uh, and on the other hand, that children uh, benefit from being in a situation where those adults have harmonious relationships with one another. And the final set of factors have to do with the um, circumstances in which those children are being raised. Um, uh, children, on average, do better when the, uh, they grow up in circumstances where there are adequate economic resources and where the children and the parents um, have adequate social and emotional supports. So, Dr. Lamb, what makes a good parent? A good parent is somebody who um, uh, is committed to, loves, is engaged with, um, uh, and uh, focuses their attention on their parent, somebody, uh, sorry, on that child. Uh, a good parent is one who is effective at reading the signals of that child, understanding what that child needs, and providing appropriate stimulation, guidance, and, and setting appropriate limits for their children. Uh, and parents who provide that kind of committed, loving care um, have children who are more likely to be well-adjusted. Is it the same criteria that apply to mothers and fathers of children? Um, there's a substantial amount of evidence documenting precisely that, namely that what makes for an effective parent is the same regardless of whether that parent is a, a mother or a father. I'd now like to uh, publish a second demonstrative, and this one is a uh, quote from uh, <coughs> Mr. Cooper's opening statement. And here he was quoting uh, a speech from, of President Obama. And I'll just read the... Uh, the quotation, we know the statistics that children who grow up without a father are five times more likely to live in poverty and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of schools, and 20 times more likely to end up in prison. Dr. Lamb, how, does, how do you square that statement with your understanding of the field of developmental psychology? Well, I think there, there are a couple of things one needs to note about this quote, first of all. Uh, um, the first is that, of course, while it talks about some individuals being five, nine, or, or 20 times more likely to have some adverse uh, outcomes, it doesn't say in comparison to what, um, uh, which, of course, makes it somewhat difficult to understand exactly what is, is being said here. Presumably, these statistics refer to a comparison between children being raised by um, uh, to heterosexual parents as opposed to those who are growing up um, living with a single heterosexual mother. Um, uh, that is to say the statistics probably are not uh, drawn from studies that are focused on children being raised by same-sex parents, either singly or um, in couples. Um, uh, the third point to note is that um, uh, this citation of statistics doesn't address the important distinction between correlation and causality. Um, uh, it provides these statistics and perhaps implies to many listeners that it is the absence of a father in and of itself that causes the adverse outcomes that are described here. 
Um, uh, actually, the research, which is now quite voluminous, shows that it, the absence of the father in and of itself isn't the crucial factor. Rather, what's important in accounting for these differences are the factors that, that you showed in the initial overhead. Um, and that children are more likely to have some of these problems when they, are, they have suffered the separation from one of their parents, for example, uh, and therefore have had the, been deprived of the benefits of that person's uh, involvement in their lives, uh, when they've been exposed to significant degrees of conflict between the parents, and when they've had to cope with the significant degrees of uh, economic deprivation that are often associated with, with divorce or separation. So those are the factors that better explain why you might have some of these differences. And it's important for a researcher to ask those questions about why these differences exist rather than simply to note the, the numbers themselves. Um, the final thing that, that's missing here and that um, uh, would concern me as a, as a summary of the evidence is that it doesn't acknowledge the fact that um, notwithstanding these differences, the majority of children growing up in families without um, uh, their father are perfectly well adjusted. Dr. Lamb, did you ever hold the view that children need a family structure with a male parent to adjust well? Um, uh, you know, when I began my career in the early 1970s, that was widely believed to be true. Um, uh, and so when I began my research, it was with the um, uh, presumption or prediction that um, uh, this was likely to be the case. My first research was concerned with uh, exploring the attachments that, that young babies form to their mothers and fathers. Um, uh, and I explored in that early research the differences in the ways in which mothers and fathers behaved um, uh, and asked whether those differences, in fact, were important, whether they did show that children needed to be raised by a masculine as well as by a feminine um, uh, parent. The results of, of both my research and more significantly, the larger body of research that developed since the early 1970s um, has made clear that that initial prediction was incorrect. Um, uh, and we have now, as a field, come to the conclusion that I stated earlier, that what makes for an effective parent is the same whether or not you are talking about a mother or a father, um, uh, and that children do not need to have a masculine behaving uh, parent figure, a father, in order to be well adjusted. Is there any support for the view that children need to have a female parent to adjust well? No, the same is true with respect to that. How long has it been accepted as the consensus view within your field that the three factors you described earlier, as opposed to family structure, are the factors that most affect child adjustment? Um, I think that the field um, uh, began to coalesce around and to focus on these issues from um, the early to mid-1980s. And I would say that by the beginning of the 1990s, this would have been the overwhelming consensus in the field. And if I could get into Cambridge and take a class in developmental psychology, is this what I would be taught today? It is. Um, do you have? You should have in front of you a uh, copy of two books. Uh, one is your own book, um, "The Role of the Father in Child Development," and that has been marked as PX two two six six. And the other is a, a book by Susan Galambach entitled "Parenting: What Really Counts." And that is marked as DIX 792. Uh, Dr. Lamb, did these books inform your opinions in this case? Yes, they did. Are these books representative of the body of research on the central factors that affect child adjustment? Yes, they are. Your Honor, at this time, I would like to offer into evidence exhibits PX 2266 and DIX 792.
No objection, Your Honor. Very well. Both are admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Lamb, have researchers within your field conducted any studies of the adjustment of children raised by gay or lesbian parents? They have, yes. And these studies have appeared in peer-reviewed journals? Yes, they have. And I believe you testified before it was approximately 100 journals, is that, uh, 100 studies, is that correct? There, there would be at least 100 peer-reviewed reports, yes. Who are the leading researchers in this field? And there, well, there are a number of, of uh, researchers both here and in Europe. I think um, Dr. Charlotte Patterson and Jennifer Wainwright at the University of Virginia um, uh, would be among those. My colleague Susan Golombach at, at Cambridge um, uh, and um, researchers such as uh, Anne Brevais and Henny Boss in the Netherlands would be among some of the most significant contributors to the literature. What methodology did these researchers employ in their studies? Well, these researchers employ a, a wide variety of methodologies. Um, uh, they use, first of all, different ways of, of recruiting subjects for study, uh, drawing upon both convenience and uh, representative samples in order to conduct their research. Um, uh, and in the course of collecting data, they um, uh, use various techniques from uh, survey responses uh, to the use of standardized tests um, to y using systematic interviews of children, of their parents, of their teachers, um, uh, and of course doing systematic observations of those individuals, both the, the parents as well as the children. So there's, there's a, a wide variety of techniques that have been used in this field, as in most other research on children's adjustment. And are each of those methodologies you just described accepted as reliable within your field? Yes, they are. How would you say the, the researchers' use of diverse methodologies has affected the, the field? Well, I think from my point of view, the, the broader the range of methods employed, um, uh, the more confident one can be about the results in a body of research. Um, uh, the more different sorts of techniques, the more different types of, of uh, research methods of sampling, um, uh, the more different the, the groups and samples that have been studied, the more confident one can be that, that the results really are painting a consistent body of, of literature and contributing to a coherent understanding of the factors that affect children's development. Dr. Lim, what is a representative sample, as that term is used in your field? Well, the term representative sample is, is one that, that um, is employed particularly by sociologists and, and demographers, uh, and that involves trying to find a, or collect a sample of individuals um, within some target population, say the population of the United States, and drawing a smaller number of people to study more intensively who perfectly represent the characteristics of the population as a whole. Dr. Lamb, please turn to tab D at the bottom of your exhibit binder, and behind tab D you should find four exhibits marked as PX778, PX1066, PX1111, and PX1116. Dr. Lamb, did each of those studies employ a representative sample in their research? Yes, each of these included representative samples. And did each of those studies study the adjustment of children of gay or lesbian parents? They do, yes. The studies inform your opinions in this case? They did, yes. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to offer into evidence exhibits PX778, PX1066, PX1111, and PX1116. No objection, Your Honor. Very well. They will be admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Lamb, what is a convenience sample? Well, a convenience sample is one that, that a researcher studies um, because um, uh, there are a group of individuals um, uh, of the characteristics that, that you want to uh, study 
who can conveniently be um, obtained for study. So, for example, for a, a researcher uh, doing a study in, in, on any topic, but let's say on children being lesb by lesbian parents living in the Bay Area, you would try and recruit um, uh, lesbian mothers um, uh, with children of the age you wanted to study who lived with an easy access of the place where you were doing the research. And well, when do researchers in your field use convenient samples? They use them quite frequently. I would say that the majority of the research done by developmental psychologists actually involves convenience samples. And is research using convenience samples generally accepted as reliable within the field of developmental psychology? Absolutely. Please then turn to tab E at the bottom of your binder. There you will find uh, three exhibits, PX 10, 55, PX1101, and PX1115. And also beside your binder, you should find a book, PX1396. Did each of those exhibits, Dr. Lamb, use a convenience sample in the study of the adjustment of children raised by gay or lesbian parents? Yes, they did. Did those, uh, each of those studies inform your opinions in this case? Yes, they do. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to offer into evidence exhibits PX 1055, PX 1101, PX 1115, and PX 1396. No objection, Your Honor. Very well. They will be admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Lamb, what makes a study longitudinal? Uh, a longitudinal study is one in which the same individuals are studied at several points over the course of their development. Uh, and could, that's contrasted with a cross-sectional study, um, uh, which might involve choosing to study different people at um, chosen ages. Uh, and when might it be appropriate to use a cross-sectional design? Um, well, it might be appropriate to to use a cross-sectional design um, as, and of course in all of these cases, the, the design you choose depends on the research question that you have. But if, for example, your question was, um, uh, do the events that happen shortly after children begin school um, uh, affect the adjustment of children? You might want to do a study comparing five-year-olds and ten-year-olds and see whether there were higher rates of, of maladjustment in the ten-year-olds than the five-year-olds um, uh, as one way of seeing whether this was a significant period of time in which adjustment, um, the maladjustment emerged. Have any of the studies of the adjustment of children of gay or lesbian parents used a longitudinal design? Yes, they have. Can you please turn to tab F at the bottom of your binder? There you will find just one exhibit, uh, PX1088. Um, Dr. Lamb, did that, uh, is that study PX1088, is that a longitudinal study? Yes, it is. And uh, did that study inform your opinions in this case? Yes, it did. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to offer into evidence Exhibit PX 1088. No objection, Your Honor. 1088 is in. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, and now I just, Dr. Lamb, want to refer you back quickly to Tab E, uh, which two, for two exhibits that have already been ad admitted, PX 1101 and then the book, uh, PX 1396. The book is the book by Fiona Tasker and Susan Glombach, Growing Up in a Lesbian Family. Uh, did both of those studies also use a longitudinal design? Yes, they did. Now, by contrast, have any of the studies of children or gay or lesbian parents used cross-sectional designs? Yes, they have. All right, for that, let's turn to tab G. And I'll direct you to exhibit PX1072. The study by Chan and others. Is this a uh, cross-sectional study, Dr. Lamb? Yes, it is. 
and did it inform your opinions, your opinions in this case? Yes, it did. Uh, at this time, Your Honor, I'd like to offer into evidence Exhibit PX 1072. No objection, Your Honor. Very well. 1072 is in. Thank you. Now, referring back to tab D, just very quickly, PX 1066. This is a study by Susan Galambach entitled Children with Lesbian Parents, a Community Study. And then PX 1116. Uh, this is a, a study by Jennifer Wainwright entitled Psychosocial Adjustment, School Outcomes and Romantic Relationships of Adolescents with Same-Sex Parents. These have been previously admitted. Did these studies also use a cross-sectional design? Yes, they did. Now, Dr. Lamb, finally, what is a literature review? Well, a literature review is a uh, report, article, or chapter written by a scholar attempting to synthesize the body of literature uh, with respect to some particular question or topic. And if you could please turn to tab H in your uh, witness binder there. There you should find three exhibits, DIX2424, PX1384, and PX1093. Are these three exhibits literature reviews, Dr. Lamb? Yes, they are. Did they inform your opinions in this case? Yes, they did. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to offer those, those three exhibits, PX1093, PX1384, and DIX2424 into evidence. No objection, Your Honor. Very well. So, Dr. Lamb, based on all of those studies we uh, just admitted into evidence, um, what conclusions have you drawn with respect to the impact of gay or lesbian parenting on children's and adolescents' adjustment? Um, well, I think those articles are representative of a much larger body of research uh, focused on this question, um, uh, documenting very conclusively that children who are raised by gay and lesbian parents are just as likely to be well-adjusted as children raised by heterosexual parents. Um, uh, that's a conclusion that has been documented in studies uh, using, as I said, a variety of methods, uh, a variety of ways of, of obtaining samples, um, uh, asking different sorts of questions about uh, various aspects of adjustment involving children and adolescents of, of different ages. Um, uh, and the conclusiveness of that evidence is, in, in my mind, um, further supported by the fact that the results obtained in the studies that involve uh, gay and lesbian parents are completely consistent with our broader understanding of the factors that affect children's adjustment, uh, as I explained at the beginning of my testimony. Would you say that your conclusions, Dr. Lamb, are reflective of a consensus within the field of developmental psychology? Yes, they are. Could you please turn to tab I in your binder? There you'll find PX766. And uh, what is that document, Dr. Lamb? Uh, this is a policy statement issued by the American Psychological Association entitled Sexual Orientation, Parents, and Children, uh, issued in 2004. And at this time, I'd like to publish a, a demonstrative with some of the text from that policy statement. Dr. Lamb, could you please read the text in the highlighted box to the, the top? The, this is 766? PX 766. That been admitted? Is not yet, Your Honor. Let's admit it before we read from it. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. At this time, Your Honor, I would ask that you take judicial notice of the American Psychological Association's policy statement concerning the sexual orientation of parents and children. No objection, Your Honor. Very well. 766 will be admitted. 
Would you like me to read? Please now read from the top box. The first box reads, There is no scientific basis for concluding that lesbian mothers or gay fathers are unfit parents on the basis of their sexual orientation. And they cite to three reports. On the contrary, results of research suggest that lesbian and gay parents are as likely as heterosexual parents to provide supportive and healthy environments for their children. Dr. Lamb, do you believe that this policy statement from which you just read accurately summarizes the state of the social science research on the effect of gay and lesbian parenting on child adjustment? Yes, I think it does. And could you uh, now read the second box, please? Second box reads, Overall, results of research suggest that the development, adjustment, and well-being of children with lesbian and gay parents do not differ markedly from that of children with heterosexual parents. Dr. Lamb, do you believe that conclusion is adequately supported by the research in your field? I do, yes. Thank you. Now, are you aware of any other professional organizations that have issued policy statements on the subject of gay and lesbian parenting? Uh, there are a number of other professional organizations that have issued those, yes. Um, I'd now like to publish a demonstrative with the lists of the various associations. And I will read those. Um, that would be the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Psychoanalytic Association, the American Psycho Logical Association, which we just discussed, the Child Welfare League of America, the National Association of Social Workers, and the North American Council on Adoptable Children. Dr. Lamb, to your knowledge, have all of these professional organizations issued policy statements on the subject of gay and lesbian parenting? Yes, all of them have. And could you please turn to tab J in your witness binder? And uh, there you will find seven exhibits marked as PX753, PX757, PX762, PX763, PX768, PX1025, and PX1032. Are these exhibits the uh, policy statements from the organizations I just read into the record? They appear to be, yes. And are these uh, policy statements from these national professional associations consistent with the opinions you've developed in connection with this case? They are, yes. Your Honor, at this time I would ask that the court take judicial notice of the eight policy statements. You've already admitted one, PX766, but I would ask that you now admit exhibits PX753, PX757, PX762, PX763, PX768, PX1025, and PX1032. Very well. Be admitted. Dr. Lim, have you ever heard the view that children raised by gay or lesbian parents were at greater risk of suffering gender identity disorder than children raised by heterosexual parents? Yes, I have heard that. Can you explain what a gender identity disorder is? Uh, a gender identity disorder is a, um, a psychiatric or psychological problem um, uh, which involves an individual feeling uncomfortable with his or her gender. And have researchers in your field studied whether children parented by gay men and lesbians suffer from gender identity disorders more frequently than children raised by heterosexual parents? Uh, they have, yes. Uh, gender identity disorders, I should uh, point out, are extremely rare. Um, uh, and there's no evidence that they are more common uh, when children are being raised by gay and lesbian parents. Please turn to tab B in your witness binder, which is marked as PX2350. This is an email from Ron Prentice, which is, attaches an article entitled 
21 Reasons Why Gender Matters. Did you review this document in connection with your work in this case? I did, yes. Your Honor, at this time I would ask that we admit TX2350. No objection, Your Honor. TX2530 is admitted? It's 2350. I'm sorry, 23. Yes, P, uh, my, my mistake. I transpose them. Is it 2350? Yes, it is, Your Honor. All right, I'm sorry. At this time, I would like to publish a demonstrative from PX2350. Dr. Lamb, could you please read the highlighted text? Yes, the text says, one of the major, main examples of gender confusion is what some are calling gender disorientation pathology. This is the term used to describe homosexual, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender relationships. In these and other cases, there is a major distortion or disordering of the male or female gender and a confusion of both gender and sexuality. Dr. Lamb, are you familiar with the term gender disorientation pathology? I, I'm afraid I'm not, no. I don't believe it's one that is used in the um, psychiatric or psychological literature. As it's used in the field of developmental psychology, what is a pathology? Um, a pathology is a, um, a psychological disturbance that makes it difficult for a person to function appropriately. Um, uh, and when one uses that term, it would signify that the disability is sufficiently great that some kind of therapeutic or, or treatment is, is needed in order to, to deal with it. Dr. Lamb, does the field of developmental psychology describe gay or lesbian sexual orientations as a pathology? No, it does not. Why not? Um, uh, those are not categorized as, as um, pathologies. They are parts of normal variation and are considered to be um, aspects of, of well-adjusted behavior. Have studies in your field examined whether children parented by gay men or lesbians are more likely to develop a gay or lesbian sexual orientation themselves? Yes, they have. What conclusions have those studies reached? Um, those studies have shown that there is no significant increase in the proportion of children who become gay or lesbian themselves when they're raised by gay or lesbian parents. I'd now like to publish my next demonstrative from the Why Gender Matters article. Dr. Lamb, could you please read the highlighted text? Yes, the highlighted text says, while various studies indicate that around 2 to 3% of persons have ever practiced homosexual behaviors in their lifetime, a study in developmental psychology found that 12% of the children of lesbians became active lesbians themselves. Dr. Lamb, does the text uh, that you just read not call into conclusion, not call into question the conclusion you just gave to the court? Uh, no, it doesn't, because um, the reference study um, uh, that is cited here as, as footnote 84 um, reported that there was no significant difference between the group of children being raised by lesbian mothers and the groups of children being raised by heterosexual mothers. You are familiar with the study cited in footnote 84? I am, yes. You know who wrote that study? It was a study conducted by Susan Golombach and her colleagues. And uh, how, how do you know Susan Golombach, Professor Lamb? Well, I've known of her research for many years. Um, uh, she's now a colleague of mine at the University of Cambridge. Does the research in your field uh, establish ways in which children raised by gay men and lesbians might differ from children raised by heterosexuals? Um, it does, yes. Um, uh, there have been a number of studies that, that have, for example, shown that uh, in some cases children gay, raised by gay and lesbian parents have less sex stereotyped attitudes than those being raised by heterosexual parents. Can you give me an example of a sex stereotyped attitude? Um, uh, well, the, the most obvious ones would have to do with um, uh, children's understanding or aspirations um, uh, for themselves. Children who are more 
sex stereotype might think, for example, that um, uh, girls should aspire to be nurses at, while boys aspire to be doctors. Um, uh, that there are certain behaviours that are more appropriate for boys than for girls. Within your field, is a child's failure to adopt sex stereotype attitudes viewed as a maladjustment? No, it's not. It's, it's viewed as an aspect of normal variation. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to turn to my next demonstrative from the 21 Reasons Why Gender, Matter article, Gender Matters article. Could you read the two highlighted boxes, please, Dr. Lamb? The sad truth is homosexual abuse of children is proportionately higher than heterosexual abuse of children. It must be stressed that most homosexuals do not abuse children, and most are not pedophiles, but it seems a significant number do and are. It is the right of the child to know and have a relationship with their biological mother and father. It is the right of the child to be protected from sexual exploitation. Gender disorientation pathology greatly increases the risk that children will suffer sexual exploitation. It is our duty to protect them. You, Dr. Lamb, do you agree with the statement that homosexual sexual orientations, quote, greatly increases the risk that children will suffer sexual exploitation? Absolutely not. It is um, clearly established that children are um, at no greater risk of abuse when being raised by gay and lesbian parents. Do you agree with the statement that it is the right of the child to be protected from sexual exploitation? Absolutely. Then why do you not agree with the statement that being raised by gay or lesbian parents um, increases the risk that sexual that increases the risk that children will suffer sexual exploitation? Because there's no evidence that um, gays or lesbians are more likely to sexually abuse children. Has the has that hypothesis been disproven by researchers in your field? Yes, yes. When was the first time you can recall it was disproven? Well, this is one of those fairly old canards. So the earliest uh, report that I'm familiar with was published in the late 70s, um, and there have been papers published in the 70s, 80s, and, and 90s um, documenting very, in various ways that this is simply not true. Is... Uh, one of the articles to which you are referring, an article by Carol Jenny entitled, Are Children at Risk for Sexual Abuse by Homosexuals, published in Pediatrics in 1994? Yes, that would be one of them. Are there any social science in your field or any of which you are aware that supports the notion that children need to be protected from gay men or lesbians? Is it true, Dr. Lamb, that children and adolescents raised by gay and lesbian parents sometimes are teased or bullied by their peers? Yes, it is. Have researchers in your field studied whether ch children of gay or lesbian parents have more difficulty forming healthy relationships with peers than children raised by heterosexual persons? Yes, they have. What do those studies conclude? Well, the studies conclude that... that um, whether or not children are raised by heterosexual or uh, same-sex parents, there are no differences in their ability to establish uh, appropriate social relationships with peers, either as children or as adolescents. So what inference can be drawn from the fact that children and adolescents raised by gay and lesbian parents are sometimes bullied by their peers? Um, uh, well, the studies that, that have explored this in more detail show that um, uh, while children with gay or lesbian parents are more likely to be teased about their uh, family configuration, they aren't more likely to be teased in general. Um, uh, children tease one another for a variety of reasons. Children get teased because their ethnic group is different, because they have curly hair, because they're fat, because they have a funny accent. Um, uh, children can be very cruel to one another. Um, uh, and. When it's possible to tease somebody about the sexual orientation of their parents, they may be teased for that. But that doesn't mean that they're more likely to be teased overall. 
I'd like to publish my next demonstrative from the 21 Reasons Why Gender Matters article circulated by Ron Prentice for use in sermons. Could you read the highlighted box? There is also the question of how children fare when raised in same-sex families. One person who has spent a lot of time looking into this question is psychologist Dr. Joe Nicolosi. He argues that kids raised by homosexuals are traumatized emotionally and socially. Dr. Lamb, is there any social science in your field or any of which you are aware that supports the notion that, quote, kids raised by homosexuals are traumatized emotionally and socially? No, there is not. Dr. Lamb, who is Dr. Joe Nicolosi? Well, I have to confess, I, I didn't know who he was when I uh, saw this document, so I um, searched for him on the internet and discovered that he is a psychologist who um, practices conversion therapy um, uh, for homosexual individuals. Dr. Lamb, are you familiar with the notion of the necessity of gender differentiated parenting? Yes, I am. Could you please describe uh, what the, the concept of gender differentiated parenting entails? Well, this is a concept that um, uh, we talked about briefly earlier on, um, uh, holding that in order to be well adjusted, children need to be raised by a male parent as well as by a female parent. Um, uh, and as I said that earlier on in, in responding to you, there's a, now a significant body of evidence documenting that that's really not true, that what's important for children's development and adjustment is the quality of the parenting that they obtain from the people who are raising them, and that the gender is not one of those important dimensions. I'd like to publish my next demonstrative from the 21 Reasons Why Gender Matters article circulated by Ron Prentice. Dr. Lamb, could you read the highlighted box, please? We should disavow the notion that mummies can make good daddies, just as we should disavow the notion of radical feminists that daddies can make good mummies. The two sexes are different to the core, and each is necessary, culturally and biologically, for the optimal development of a human being. Dr. Lamb, in, in the uh, quote you just read, to whom is it attributed? It's attributed to uh, David Popener, who's a sociologist recently retired from um, Rutgers University. And is Dr. Popeno a leading proponent of the notion of the necessity of gender differentiated parenting? Yes, he is. Is there anyone else you can think of who is a proponent of the theory of gender differentiated parenting? The other person who comes to mind is um, David Blankenhorn. And do you believe that the notion is adequately supported by the social science in your field? No, I believe it's not supported by the social science research. Is there any social science in your field or any of which you're aware that supports the conclusion that a parent's failure to observe traditional gender roles will harm a child? There is not. Dr. Lammer, are you aware of the notion that the ideal family structure for children requires a child to be raised by the mother and father who are the child's genetic parents? I am. Is there any basis in the social science research in your field for the conclusion that the absence of a genetic relationship between parent and child will increase the likelihood of poor adjustment outcomes for that child? Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Is there any basis for the conclusion that the absence of a genetic relationship between parent and child increases the likelihood of poor adjustment outcomes for the child. There is no support for that. Is there any social science of which you're aware that tends to contradict it? There is. There have been a number of studies that, that um, address that issue, including um, many studies that focus on children um, who have been adopted, um, as well as a number of uh, studies um, focused on children 
who have been conceived through a variety of, of um, reproductive technologies um, which lead to them being raised by parents who are not their biological parents. And what did those studies conclude? Those studies show that children are just as likely to be well adjusted um, uh, as children who are being raised by their biological parents. Could you please turn to tab M in your witness binder, Dr. Lamb? And there you should find three exhibits. TX779. PX1100 and PX1108. Dr. Lamb, do these articles exemplify the research you just described, demonstrating that children without a genetic relationship to parents are just as likely to adjust well as children who are genetically related to their parents? They do, yes. Did these articles inform your opinion in this case? Your Honor, at this time I'd like to move into evidence exhibits PX779, PX1100, and PX1108. No objection, Your Honor. Well, <coughs> they are admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Lamb, in your expert opinion, is there any way that prohibiting same-sex couples from marrying could be expected to improve the adjustment outcomes of their children? No, there is not. Is there any way that prohibiting same-sex couples from marrying could reasonably be expected to improve the adjustment outcomes of any child? I don't think so. When an unmarried cohabitating couple marries, does that improve the likelihood that their child will achieve a good adjustment outcome? It definitely can. Why? Um, because it allows those children to benefit from some of the advantages that accrue to marriage, including the fact that it's a recognized social institution, and so being able to consider themselves part of a well-recognized institution can be beneficial for some students, some, some children. And as that uh, study supported by social science in, in your field? Is that conclusion supported by social science studies in your field? Yes. Now, is there any reason that conclusion would not hold true if the unmarried cohabitating couple were gay or lesbian? Not. The in the thousands of books and publications you have written and reviewed in your career, have you ever encountered a sound rationale for purposefully denying a child the opportunity to achieve the best possible adjustment outcome? No, I have not. I have no more questions, Your Honor. Very well. Thank you, Mr. McGill. You may cross-examine Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Your Honor. We, we have the first of several installments of binders. We'd like to hand out our first two sets of binders, if we may. May I approach, Your Honor? May. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Lamb. Good morning. Uh, you are, you've been a member of the American Civil Liberties Union, is that correct? That is correct. And a member of the National Organization of Women, is that correct? Yes, it is. And a member of the NAACP, is that correct? Yes, it is. And a member of Amnesty International, is that correct? Yes. And the Nature Conservancy, is that correct? 
Yes. And you've even given money to PBS. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so we can agree you're, you're a committed liberal. Is that right? Um, I wouldn't say I'm necessarily a committed liberal. Uh, you, you believe that gays and lesbians should have the right to marry, correct? That's what I testified, yes. Okay, and you personally approve of same-sex marriage, is that right? I do. You're not a clinical psychologist, correct? That's correct. You've never treated patients, correct? Correct. Uh, the last time you actually interviewed a child as part of a study was over 20 years ago, correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. You, you've never interviewed... Can the I just interrupt? That, that was um, uh, my best guess at the time of the, interview, uh, uh, the deposition. It's still my best guess now. Okay. Uh, you, you can't remember the last time you interviewed a child in a study. Is that your testimony? can't remember the date of the last time I did it. That's but, correct. But you think it was more than two decades ago? I think it was around two decades ago, I think. You've never interviewed the child of a gay male couple in any professional capacity, correct? That's correct. You've never interviewed the child of a lesbian couple in any professional capacity, correct? Correct. You've never completed a study of children raised by gay and lesbian parents, correct? That's correct. You would doubt that the members of the American Psychological Association would unanimously endorse the positions you've taken in this case, correct? Unanimously? Um, no, probably not. Um, and you don't have an, any idea as to what percentage would agree with you, correct? Uh, no. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask you a, a few questions about the role of politics in modern day science. You would agree that social sciences like psychology are not hermetically sealed from political influence, correct? Well, I think um, none of us are hermetically sealed from the world around us. Is that yeah. what you mean? Well, you would agree that governments in the United States and Great Britain are not immune from the influence of politics and ideology, correct? <laughs> that may be the second thing we can agree on today. Uh, and, and universities are not free from the influence of politics, correct? Um, well, they are rife with politics with a small p, um, uh, how much they are influenced by politics with a big P, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, universities are not free from the influences of ideological forces, correct? I, I'm not quite sure I know what you mean. Well, in other words, if there's a prevailing ideology within a society, that often manifests itself in, at universities, correct? Well, yeah, there would probably be some people who have a variety of, of ideological views, yes. And, and think tanks often reflect a particular ideological view, correct? I think that's correct, yes. And some major charitable organizations <clears throat> often reflect a particular ideological point of view, correct? Uh, I'm not sure about that, but, but perhaps. I can't think of any as we talk. Uh, Funding for sophisticated, high-quality psychological research is often provided by governments, universities, think tanks, and major charitable organizations, correct? Objection. Funding for uh, sophisticated, high-quality psychological research is often provided by governments, correct? It, yes, it's usually provided by government research agencies. Okay. Uh, and, and the funding that is available for studies dictates, to a large extent, the type of studies that are conducted, correct? Uh, I, can I just suggest, I, th I think your question presumes that the decisions are being made by governments about what sorts of topics should be studied. Uh, in fact, certainly in this country, agencies like the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health pride themselves on having uh, peer reviewers evaluate the scientific quality and integrity and importance of the research. Um, and I think they would vociferously ob object to the implication that, that um, uh, it is a, a government ideological identification of the importance of a problem that, that determines what gets funded. 
Have, you've mentioned peer review here and in your direct testimony. Um, have you read any of the emails about uh, the East Anglia Climate Gate? Um, uh, I haven't read any of the emails. I've certainly heard about them. Okay, and isn't it possible that even in the peer reviewing process, politics can seep into that process? Well, I have to say, based on, on my experience doing it, um, uh, that that's not seemed to be um, a factor. Uh, now, let's talk about uh, consensus and the importance of consensus within the scientific community. You would agree that history is littered with scientific theories that were widely accepted within a scientific community and that have proven to be wrong, correct? Well, I'm not sure about that. Well, let's take phrenology. Phrenology was widely accepted within the scientific community, correct? Uh, I think, and I'm not an expert on the history of science or on the history of phrenology, but I think it's more accurate to say that at a time there were several people who believed strongly in it whether it represented uh, all the knowledgeable individuals who might have constituted the field of psychologists or neurologists at that time, it would be more debatable. But all the scientists who believed it were wrong, correct? Yes. And Freud's theory... And, uh, may we just point out that many of them weren't scientists. But so, some of them, some of them were. The founder of it was Franz Gall. Is that right? Do you know? I don't know. Okay. Uh, but uh, there was a time when Freud's theory of psychoanalysis was widely accepted by many psychologists. Correct. Um, particularly by psychiatrists and treating a clinical psychologist. That's correct. But today, most contemporary psychology bears little resemblance to and makes little more than passing references to psychoanalysis, correct? Objection. You understand the question? Yeah, I do. All right. Okay. Objection over. Um, uh, I think that that's probably true if you're referring to the um, body of, of scientific psychology and research. Um, I think that that wouldn't necessarily be as true if you were talking about, you know, therapeutic um, clinical contexts. There are certainly pockets of, of places where psychoanalysis um, holds, but certainly it's my view that it's um, uh, beyond some rather broad contributions that made to the field um, uh, that it's not a major uh, intellectual player today. Well, I'd like to uh, direct your attention to tab one of binder one, mm -hmm. uh, which is your deposition in this case, and to page 191, line nine, and please let me know when you're there. I'm there. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you, you gave the testimony so that I think it's not unfair to say that most contemporary psychology bears little resemblance to and makes little more than passing references to psychoanalysis. And you gave that testimony, correct? That's correct. All right. Um, with respect to homosexuality, at the beginning of the 20th century, there was widespread consensus within the psychological community that homosexuality was a pathological condition, correct? Uh, I'm not a clinical psychologist, but I think that that's correct. And the psychological community was entirely wrong, wasn't it? Well, th that portion of the scientific of the psychological community that held that belief was wrong. Yes. All right now, I'd like to direct your attention to your uh, to tab seven, which is in your second binder. The way these binders are organized is tab one has your testimony in this and many other cases, and then tab the second binder has some. I don't have it yet. Oh, you, oh, I apologize. Um. Oh, they're upside down. 
Documents are upside down, yes. Oh, I apologize about that, uh, Your well, Honor. Well, that's okay. Oh, I see. We have the same problem. All right. Thank you, fine. <clears throat> Sorry about that, Your Honor. <clears throat> okay. okay. Um, all right, uh, Dr. Lamb, I'd like to refer your attention to uh, tab 7, and this is uh, PX 1026, um, and it's a policy statement of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and I'm, I'm afraid I, I, I didn't memorize, Your Honor, every PX that was being moved in, but in an abundance of caution, I'd like to ask the court to take judicial notice of PX 1026. Assume there's no objection to admitting 1026. Very well. <clears throat> okay. Um, and <clears throat> uh, Dr. Lamb, referring your attention to the second paragraph, it says, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender individuals historically have faced more rigorous scrutiny than heterosexual people regarding their rights to be or become parents. The American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry opposes any discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity against individuals in regard to their rights as custodial, foster, or adoptive parents. Uh, Dr. Lamb, there is not a rich empirical literature relating to child outcomes of transgender individuals. Is that right? I'm not familiar with it, no. Right. And, and there is not a rich literature on the child outcomes of the children of bisexuals, correct? That's correct. So this statement is not based on empirics, but rather than politics, correct? Well, I can't speak to the basis, but that, that would be my understanding, yes. Okay. As for the American Psychological Association, you simply don't know whether any non-scientific considerations play a role in the APA's treatment of same-gender issues, correct? I'm not a member of the APA. I wasn't involved in its <coughs> discussion, so I have no idea. During your, I, I'd like to ask you some definitional matters so that during our time today we're on the same page in terms of the terms we're using. Um, you referred to uh, gays and lesbians, and, and my first question is, is the accepted conclusion is that there are probably somewhere around 2% of the adult population that is gay or lesbian? I think that's the um, consensus. Uh, I think most people often express it as a, as a range, but it would be a range around that, yes. And, and um, <clears throat> But, but for you, the, your belief is that the accepted conclusion is that there are probably somewhere around 2% of the adult population that is gay or lesbian, correct? Yeah, I'm not a demographer, but that sounds like um, about the right figure that I hear people talk about. There are some individuals who might consider themselves to have a same-sex orientation, but do not have the erotic component as part of that identity, correct? Uh, again, that's moving outside the area of, of my expertise, but that's probably true. As, and for the purposes of most of the research you rely upon, you're talking about individuals who define themselves as having a sexual orientation towards members of the same sex and would self-identify as lesbian, gay, or heterosexual, correct? That's correct. And you use the term gender orientation and sexual orientation interchangeably, correct? I confess that I do. I'm trying to be better behaved and to talk about it as sexual <laughs> yeah. uh, In the past, you've used the term gender orientation as the sexual object focus of sexual romantic interest, correct? They have done. It doesn't sound like a, a word that I would normally use, but I may well have done so. Well, let, let me just refresh your recollection. Let's turn back to binder one and to your deposition testimony in the Howard case. That was a case, uh, it, was it in Arkansas, uh, Dr. Lamb? Yes. All right, and that would be <clears throat> behind tab four. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to direct your attention to page 18 and lines 11 through 15. <clears throat> and let me know, are you there, Professor, Dr. Lamb? Line, sorry? Uh, lines 11 through 15, you were asked, you say gender orientation. How would you define that answer? 
gender orientation as defining one's sexual, the sexual object focus of sexual romantic interest, Objection. whether that is focused on male or female. Did you give that testimony? Or an objection. objection. What is the objection? Your Honor, the witness said he wasn't, he couldn't recall whether he had used it or not, and I wanted to refresh his recollection. That purpose, you may. <clears throat> Does this refresh record? your recollection that you defined it during your Howard deposition in the way that's reflected here? Yeah, I, I suspect that the word object is a, um, a mistranscription of something that I said. But, but the, the focus of sexual romantic interest is... Um, what I was trying to say. So I'm not trying to dispute it. I suspect that the word object wasn't used, but I don't have a great problem with that. You also referred to the term well-being and psychological adjustment, and you use those as synonyms, correct? Yes. And you use both terms as fairly broad terms to comp comprise a variety of possible ways of assessing how well children are doing psychologically as individuals, correct? That's correct. And you're not explicitly trying to exclude any index of mental health when you use the term well-being, correct? I think that's correct, yes. Y you would concede that there's still many differences between men and women in our society, correct? Yes. Men are much more likely to be incarcerated for committing a crime than women, correct? That's correct. Uh, there is evidence that men are more likely to be engaged in violent altercations, correct? Yes. Men are more likely to be aggressive, correct? Yes. Men are more likely to be alcoholics than women, correct? I think so. And having an alcoholic parent can affect a child's psychological well-being, correct? Yes. Women live longer than men, correct? Uh, on average, yes. The death of a parent is a traumatic event for a child, correct? Can be, yes. Men and women get different types of diseases at different rates, correct? Yes. And the health of parents can have an effect on the psychological well-being of children, correct? Yes. The intelligence of parents can have an effect on the psychological well-being of children, correct? Mm, that's a trickier one. Um, uh, I'm not sure that the intelligence of parents directly affects the well-being of their children. Um, I suppose. Well, it's certainly possible that if someone uh, if uh, someone were able to get into Cambridge and come uh, learn about your processes, they'd be in a better position to be a good parent than if they were illiterate and never heard of them, right? Well, I'm not sure um, that that's true, and I'm not sure that the better educated people are necessarily always better parents. Um, uh, I suppose that you could make the case that that people who had um, uh, extremely low levels of intelligence might make it difficult for them to perform some of the functions of, of parenting. Um, okay. So it, it, could, it, it could indirectly affect children's adjustment. All right, well, let's look and see if there are any differences in the bell curve between men and women, and I direct your attention to tab eight of your binder. So back to the other binder. Yes. And in particular, I'd like to direct your attention to page 7 of 19, as reflected in the bottom right-hand corner. Mm -hmm. And it, it says in the uh, second to last sentence, and, and this is, I, I should say for the record, is a, uh, a, a document uh, written by a Diane Halpern, who's a professor at Claremont McKenna, and uh, she writes, there are also disproportionately more males at the low end of cognitive abilities distribution with males overrepresented in some categories of learning disabilities and retardation. The low end of verbal abilities provides a very clear example of this. Isn't it true that men, uh, there are, if you look at the Homer Simpsons of the world, there are a lot more men than women? <laughs> 
I, I suspect that she's talking of people who are uh, performing much less well than Homer Simpson, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that was possible, but uh, all right. Um, now, uh, men drop out from, <laughs> from high school at greater rates than women, isn't that right? Uh, currently, I believe that's true, yes. And men graduate from college at lower rates than women, correct? I, I'm not sure about that. I know those statistics have been changing and probably are different in, in different contexts, so I'm not sure. Educational attainment of the parents is a predictor of psychological well-being and adjustment, correct? Um, uh, it can be associated with some of the processes we talked about, yes. And uh, w we can also agree that men can't breastfeed, correct? Yes, correct. And breastfeeding clearly has benefits for children insofar as it helps to provide sources of immunity to children that are beneficial to them, correct? That's correct. Economic resources are quite reliably a predictor of differences in children's adjustment, correct? That's correct. And it's a regrettable fact that women in the United States continue to earn less than men, correct? Yes, I think that's true. And uh, do, you, do you know whether lesbians on average have higher or lower household income than heterosexual couples? Uh, I'm not sure. There are differences between the earning power of gay men and lesbians, correct? I'm not sure. That's Well, let, let's just uh, look and see uh, whether you have a reaction to the uh, what's behind tab 9, which is DIX 96, uh, and this is the expert declaration <coughs> of Lee Badgett, of, of, of Lee, ba Lee Badgett, um, submitted in the NRA marriage cases <coughs> in California, and she says uh, on page 5 of this document, uh, in paragraph 13, uh, contrary to a popular stereotype, same-sex couples in California have household incomes that are comparable to ma their married counterparts. After controlling for educational attainment, race, and age, male couples' average household income is approximately 4% higher than married couples' average household income, while female couples' average household income is approximately 7% lower than married couples' household income. And, and that would be, it'd be important to hold constant for uh, the level of resources available to a family in terms of doing the types of studies you rely on. Is that fair to say? That would be fair to say, I, uh, and I'm sure that uh, Professor Badgett knows what she's talking about. J do want to draw your attention to the fact, though, that this is talking about same-sex couples in general, not necessarily those who are raising children. Um, uh, so, and one would want to be focused on the particular group that you're talking about. Uh, now, are you familiar with evidence that wives spend money differently, or I should say that women spend money differently than men uh, in terms of uh, as it relates to children? Uh, I'm not familiar with research on that. Uh, gender is also related to certain occupations, correct? Uh, there are certain occupations where um, some genders are, are more prominent than others, yes. Although and gender is... actually change pretty dramatically over time. Uh, gender is associated with educational opportunities, correct? Um... I'm not sure it's associated with, with um, uh, opportunities. It may be associated in some context with whether or not people take advantage of opportunities. But Men are more likely to perpetrate sexual abuse than women are as a general characteristic, correct? That's correct. As a result, stepfathers are much more likely to be perpetrators of sexual abuse than stepmothers, correct? That's correct. And stepfathers are more likely than biological fathers to abuse their children, correct? I think that's correct, too, yes. And stepfathers molest children at a higher rate than stepmothers, correct? Yes, correct. And molestation of a child negatively impacts the child's development, correct? It certainly can, yes. And there is evidence that men who are married to women, however, are less likely to drink heavily and less likely to gamble, correct? 
Um, uh, I've heard of that research. It's obviously outside my expertise, range of expertise, yes. When it comes to parenting skills and abilities, you're not saying that men and women are completely interchangeable, correct? Um, what I'm saying is that where it comes to the aspects of parenting that affect children's adjustment, um, this, it's the same features of the parent's behavior that are important for their children's adjustment. I'd like to direct your attention to page 225 of your deposition in this case, lines 9 through 14. But that's back to... Binder 1, the testimony binder. Okay, the number 1. And what pages was that? Uh, 225. Okay. okay. Um, and line nine, it says, um, let me make sure I'm in the right place here. Um, right, line nine uh, through uh, 14, uh, line nine starts with my question. Is it your opinion that men and women are completely interchangeable in terms of parenting skills and ability? Answer, well, I'm not saying they are completely interchangeable with respect to skills and abilities. And you gave that testimony, right? I did. I, I continued for several paragraphs explaining what I meant. <laughs> and, and we'll explore that in great detail today. Uh, you would concede, don't want you to lose sight of the fact that it was more. <laughs> you, you would concede that gender is a complicated variable and that it has ramifications for an individual's experiences from the beginning of their life, correct? Correct. So gender likely would be related to some of the processes relating to raising a child, but not in a necessarily straightforward uh, way, correct? Correct. And so you think gender is one of those variables that can have ripple effects in a variety of different ways on the way in which people behave and can, in a variety of ways, affect the, the way they behave with their children, correct? It can, yes. Gender is something that actually has a wide range of effects on a variety of different levels of our behavior, correct? That's correct. Father's biological, biological and socially reinforced masculine qualities predispose them to treat their children differently than do mothers, correct? I'm not sure about that. Well, let's look at tab nine of your uh, binder, your second binder. And this would be uh, 9A, actually. Mm -hmm. And turning your attention, th this is uh, called, uh, this is from 2000. Uh, it's fatherhood in the 21st century. And this is something you were a co-author of, correct? That's correct. And I'd like to direct your attention to page 130. And in particular to the right-hand column, the second full paragraph, uh, the, the, and it's the third sentence that says, father's biological and socially reinforced masculine qualities predispose them to treat their children differently than do mothers. And, and, and I'm still not sure where you are, I'm sorry. Oh, oh okay, you're on the, se the second column. Yep, it, I have you now. Okay. And when you signed on to this paper as a co-author, you believed that to be true, correct? Well, I think this is referring to David Popano and describing his position here. Yes, and, didn't, well, and, and you believed it uh, to be true, didn't you? I don't, I don't read it that way. I read it as a review which was trying to describe this position. We were supposed to be reviewing the uh, contributions to the field for over the previous decade. This was a um, millennial um, uh, review article. And as you see, David Popano's name is mentioned right at the end of the sentence preceding the one that you just and you thought you thought Mr. Popino's contribution was significant enough to be noted in your review. Is that your point? Um, uh, he had made this point during the 90s, and yeah. Well, let, let's. Uh, let's scholars, scholars like to be sure that they don't leave out things. Let, let me ask you this question: There is evidence that father absence 
has its greatest and most predictable effects when the father leaves earlier in the child's life, correct? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. There is evidence that father absence has its greatest and most predictable effects when the father leaves earlier in the child's life, correct? Well, um, uh, again, with with the provisos around the um, term effect in that context, certainly you have a, a very different set of um, processes involved when you have something occurring very early in the child's life, you have longer periods of time involved. Um, that's correct. The attachment between, the, excuse me, there are studies that show that the attachment between babies and fathers is also strong and that it might serve needs that are not met in the infant mother relationship, correct? Um, uh, well, certainly, I, I conducted a lot of that early research on, on babies' attachments to mothers and fathers, and if you're talking about babies being raised in families with two parents, um, uh, there's a significant amount of evidence that both of those relationships have an important impact on those children's development. And, and there is data that suggests that the differences between maternal and paternal behavior are more strongly related to either the parent's biological gender or sex roles than to either their degree of involvement <clears throat> in infant care or their attitudes regarding the desirability of paternal involvement in infant care, correct? I think that's generally not the case. Well, uh, let's look at uh, tab 12, and this is uh, attachment and affiliative uh, systems. And I'd like to direct your attention uh, to page uh, 117. This is a, uh, do you recall uh, writing uh, chapter 10 of this book, Effect of Gender and Caretaking Role on Parent-Infant Interaction? Believe it or not, I do, even though it was written in the late 1970s and published in 1982. Okay, and uh, let's turn to page 117. Mm -hmm. And here, you as an author wrote, the data suggest that the differences between maternal and paternal behavior are more strongly related to either the parent's biological gender or sex roles than to either their degree of involvement in infant care or their attitudes regarding the desirability of paternal involvement in infant care. You believed that at the time you wrote this, correct? I wrote this chapter describing a particular study um, that was conducted, as I said, in the late 1970s, <coughs> and the sentence that you just read was our summary of the results of that study conducted in the late 1970s. As I testified earlier, um, uh, I certainly believed at that point that, that these issues might be really important. Um, that's why we did studies like this. As I also testified earlier, that is a finding that has not held up in subsequent research. Well, uh, so science was wrong. Um, uh, science, as I understand it, is a cumulative process um, uh, in which many individuals conduct many studies asking lots of related and unrelated studies. Um, uh, and in that vast body of literature, um, uh, you will certainly find uh, cases where a finding is not replicated by other researchers. Uh, you will find cases where um, researchers find that, that one of their conclusions was distorted because of a particular measure they used, a particular procedure that they adopted. Um, and that's why it, it's important to view it as a, a cumulative process, one where you look at the, the big picture and the way in which multiple studies uh, give insight into um, the conclusions that you want to reach. Um, uh, abs it's absolutely not the case that any particular study in and of itself is going to establish an important um, association. Both mothers and fathers play crucial and qualitatively different roles in the socialization of the child, correct? Well, both mothers and fathers can play importantly different roles when children are being raised by uh, two heterosexual parents where both of those parents have significant roles in raising those children. 
And indeed, there are qualitative differences between the mother-infant and father-infant relationship, correct? Well, there are often um, uh, qualitative differences between the ways in which mothers and fathers behave in interaction with their children, as I testified earlier. Um, uh, those differences don't always exist. There are many studies that don't show them. Um, uh, and it's um, uh, now quite clear that those differences in and of themselves don't significantly affect the children's adjustment. It is disturbing that there appears to have been a devaluation of the father's role in Western society, such that many children may suffer effective paternal deprivation, correct? Well, um, uh, that would depend on the context in, in which you're talking about. But certainly there are many situations in which children um, who do have a father um, uh, don't benefit from the committed involvement of that person in their lives. Well, let's turn to tab 13. This is an article that you wrote uh, while you were at Yale. Uh, entitled Fathers, Forgotten Contributors to Child Development. And I'd like to direct your attention to the conclusion on page 260, and in particular to the first full paragraph, the uh, third sentence, which uh, reads, uh, in part, it is disturbing that there appears to have been a devaluation of the father's role in Western society, such that many children may suffer effective paternal deprivation. What was the context in which you believe that statement to be true? Well, as, as you pointed out, I wrote this when I was a graduate student, um, beginning my career uh, studying the relationships between infants and fathers um, uh, and infants and mothers. And in that context, in the context of a field where there was a tremendous focus on the relationships between uh, children and their heterosexual mothers and complete inattention to the possibility that children might have other significant relationships, I wrote this article uh, drawing attention to the fact that for those many children who grew up with two heterosexual parents, um, it was important to study the role of um, those other individuals in the child's life. I wrote another article in the, same, um, the, in the same journal a few years later, and perhaps you have this under one of these other tabs too, um, in which I pointed out that you've, you've done a great job for me in bringing, bringing back these great old memories. Um, uh, <laughs> There'll be more, <laughs> I, I'm sure, um, uh, where I focused on the fact that children actually grow up in more complicated social environments. Not only do many of them have significant relationships with fathers, many also have a significant relationship with um, uh, a brother, a sister, a uh, grandmother, um, and that we needed to look more broadly at the environment in which children were raised. And I absolutely still believe that that's the case. Uh, and I think that's entirely consistent with what I've been saying. The increase in father absence is particularly troubling because it is consistently associated with poor school achievement, diminished involvement in the labor force, early childbearing, and heightened levels of risk-taking behavior, correct? And again, I draw, this is something that we talked about earlier. That, it, that is correct. There are those associations. The interesting question is, why do those associations come about, and how can we understand those associations. And boys growing up without fathers seem especially prone to exhibit problems in the areas of sex role and gender identity development, school performance, psychosocial adjustment, and self-control, correct? Uh, and I think some of those findings have held up and some of those conclusions have, have not been uh, substantiated by a lot of the recent research. Well, let's look at, uh, just to make sure we're getting on the time, same right page on the time frame, if you look at tab 15 in your binder, mm -hmm. this is a, uh, an article from 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, it's entitled Fatherhood in the 21st Century, uh, and you were co-author of it, is that right? That's right, yes. Okay, and if we turn to the uh, second page, uh, which is page 128, in the left-hand column, second full paragraph, <coughs> The second sentence says, boys growing up with fathers seem especially prone to exhibit problems in the areas of sex role and gender identity development. Has that finding that was in your article held up? 
Um, that finding is not as clear in the larger um, sample studies that have been conducted. The, the quotation there, or citation, is to a, a study done by a psychologist, Mavis Hetherington. Um, uh, most of the, of the research um, uh, on the effects of father absence, as, as we've discussed it here, doesn't show those differences in sex role and gender identity development. All right, now how about the finding that you reference in your 2000 paper about uh, boys without fathers being prone to poor school performance? Has that held up? Yes. And what about psychosocial adjustment? Has that finding with respect to that held up? Yeah, we talked about that on the, in the direct examination. There are those correlations. And, and is there, uh, what about self-control? Um, there certainly are differences um, associated with self-control, particularly manifest, say, in uh, difficulties with delinquent behavior in adolescence. Is, is there a causal connection between father absence and these problems? No. The, the, as I tried to explain earlier, the, the literature suggests that, that um, the processes that I talked about, the quality of the relationships with the parents, the quality of the relationships between the parents and the um, social, emotional, and economic resources available to the family are the most important factors in, in directly explaining those differences. All right. Now, uh, you would agree that nurturant fathers may contribute greatly to the psychological adjustment of their daughters, correct? Yeah and uh, they may facilitate their happiness in subsequent heterosexual relationships. Yes. Yeah. All right. And there is evidence suggesting that disturbed father-child relationships and the failure to achieve same-sex identification may be pathogenic. Is that correct? Um, can we t take those two things apart? Uh, sure. Just, just repeat them again for me. The first, in terms of the importance of a... Um, a satisfying relationship with the parents, that, that's absolutely what, what I've been testifying, yes. I lost the second yes. part of your... The, the, the failure to achieve same-sex identification may be pathogenic. Is, are there some studies that suggest that? Well, I, I'm happy to refresh yes. your recollection. Uh, let's look at tab 17. This is uh, a book you edited entitled The Role of the Father in child development. This is the 1976 version and page 21, uh, the first full paragraph, it's the uh, second to last sentence, which reads, on the other hand, both disturbed father-child relationships and the failure to achieve same-sex identification may be pathogenic. No, I see that sentence, yeah. Yeah, and there are studies that, that support that, right? Um, well, again, as you pointed out, this is a chapter published in 1976, so written again when I was a student, um, and the citations here are to one paper from 1961, two from the 50s, and one from 1965. Um, uh, we've had a lot of research since that was written. And, and so those... Uh, as you pointed out, there have been subsequent editions of this book reflective of the fact that um, we've learned more uh, and our understanding of these phenomena has increased. Would you agree that the importance of fathers in fostering academic success, particularly in their sons, is clearly relevant to intervention programs aimed at improving the intellectual performance of deprived children? There's a substantial amount of evidence, which I think I referred to already, showing that when children are living with or have two parents, it's important to get as much involvement by both of those parents. Children clearly benefit when they have uh, two parents, both of whom um, are actively involved, and that's certainly true around school issues as well. Several studies have shown that fathers are more concerned than mothers about the adoption of cultural values and traditionally defined sex roles. Is that right? Um, that was certainly true of a lot of the earlier research. I, I'm not sure about that today. Um, and uh, when I say I'm not sure about it, I, I can't think of um, much research on that, as I sit here. Moral development also appears to be affected by father absence, correct? 
um, there was talk about that in the earlier literature. It's not something that has been um, explored as much more recently, but I, I suspect it's because um, researchers have shifted from focusing on some, you know, a broad term like moral development to focusing more narrowly on something like um, encounters with the police or um, delinquent behavior, say. Studies of father absence confirm that fathers influence sex roles, morality, achievement, and psychological adjustment, correct? Um, again, I think that that's a... Um, uh, it, it sounds like a relatively <coughs> older um, conclusion about the initial work on this topic. Well, and... and but I, I th you know, it, it's consistent with the overall notion that um, uh, children who don't benefit from good relationships with parents, who don't benefit from harmonious relationships with their parents, um, can have difficulties in their psychological development. Mr. Uh, Thompson, when would be a convenient time to take a morning this break? This would be a delightful time to take a break. Huh? Very well, why don't we take until uh, five minutes of the hour?